So for a little introduction, um, my name is Meredith Gershenson. I'm a research analyst here at Workforce.com. My job is really to just make sure that you guys are getting provided um, all the research with webinars, white papers, case studies, um, anything like that. And you can find all of those sources um, on our website, again, at Workforce.com. And passing it on to Owen. Um, Owen, I would love to hear a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Hey guys, my name is Owen Roth. Good morning to you. Uh, so my background, I have a degree in economics. Uh, I also spent about doing eight years in hospitality. Uh, you know, started as a host, worked my way to server, you know, did a few years as a bartender, and then eventually did about two years as a GM uh, before going to, or during college. And then, uh, yeah, I've been at, at workforce for almost uh, a little over, I think, six months now. Uh, and I've been doing basically the hospitality analytic work. So I basically tailor our product to hospitality needs, making sure, you know, our hospitality clients are being taken care of. So I'll, let, uh, I'll hand it off to Bo, let him, let him uh, introduce himself. Great. Hard to, uh, hard to follow up, but my name's Bo. Uh, I'm a... Wear a lot of different hats for workforce.com. I do a lot of analytical research. I actually spent about four years in hospitality myself. Uh, so excited to be here and get this party started. Great. That's awesome. Owen, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows 2020 was just a brutal year. Uh, I mean, the GDP across the board, just, you know, basically in March hit. We went into lockdown and everything got closed and everyone was really struggling just to, you know, make ends meet. We lost, you know, 4 million jobs in the labor market. Uh, I think no other industry was really hit harder than the hospitality industry. Um, pretty much, you know, restaurants were just forced to close completely. Hotels, if they were, you know, allowed to open or, you know, seeing just very low occupancy or rates. Uh, you know, restaurants are just trying to make ends meet by doing, uh, you know, DoorDash or Uber Eats, you know, all those types of such delivery options. And, you know, those aren't even feasible. That's just to like cover, you know, operating costs essentially. Um, and if that's even, if they even were able to do that. Uh, so 2020, absolute, you know, crazy brutal year. And, you know, we, restaurants are still trying to figure out how do we, you know, deal with the residual effects of COVID. Like we're, we're still very much in COVID with this, you know, whole Delta variant. We have tons of government regulations that are changing every day. Um, you know, people are still dealing with crazy, you know, how they manage their supplier costs. You know, how are we predicting, you know, our demand or labor, you know, or if our restaurant depends on or our hospitality set, uh, uh, business depends on, you know, other businesses operating, whether they're working from home or, you know, in office. Uh, there, there's just so many variables still in play. Uh, I mean, there's this rock, for, there, there's this great article, from, like, I think the Rockford Times, that has really, you know, hits real close to home uh, in Chicago, dealing with, uh, you know, I think it's this lady, she owns this restaurant that's been open for like 20 years, it's called, like Magpie. Uh, and essentially, she's just on the outskirts of Chicago, so she's not quite within the, you know, the county. And she's just trying to compete with the minimum wage of Chicago, which is, you know, $15 an hour. Rockford pays 11 and she's losing all her, she's trying to fill, you know, cooks, dishwasher, server, the whole, you know, whole board across the, um, you know, the forest. And, you know, she just can't compete with Amazon. She can't compete with, you know, UPS, all these stable jobs and you know these crazy you know and fluctuations of, you know um pay uh just from a county basis and she's going to be forced to close soon and that's just like the sad reality that many of these you know hospitality uh businesses are facing right now and let's see go to the next slide so from an economic st standpoint we still have this you know crazy, you know, supply and demand model where, you know, demands or labor supply is essentially coming back, but the hospitality industry isn't really feeling it still. And that's because particip participation rates are not really recovering because they're going to, you know, the labor 
supply is going to these more stable COVID, you know, jobs like Amazon and, you know, UPS where they're, they're able to just, you know, like Amazon doesn't have to deal with the consequences of closing down. If, you know, Delta V gets, you know, crazy again, they have that luxury of staying open 24 seven and, you know, the you know, mom and pop shop on main street doesn't. So people, the workers are naturally going to go to the more stable, you know, job. And it's just, it's pretty unfortunate, but like, that's just, you know, it's really hard to predict these. Um, it's really hard to predict your labor needs when, you know, you don't know if you're going to be closing down in a week or if you have a new mass mandate or, you know, new occupancy restrictions and then having to compete with that. It's also just difficult because yeah. How do you compete with those, you know, big suppliers of, you know, jobs? Yeah, I think, uh, sorry, go ahead, Bo. you know, the, the slide says, yeah, my bad. Uh, the slide says unbalanced supply and demand. I think yeah. a better way to describe it would almost be an unpredictable supply and demand. Absolutely. Uh, because in the summer, we've had such a spike in need for employment. We've had a decrease in our ability to fill those positions. And now we're almost reversing again. No mm -hmm. one really knows where this Delta variant is headed. No one knows where the economy will follow along in that that path. And so I guess, how do we solve these kind of things for our, our staffing needs when we don't even necessarily know what our staffing needs are in yeah. three months from now? Yeah. I, I've reached out to some of my, you know, restaurant friends and, you know, they keep telling me the whole like Game of Thrones spiel. It's like winter's coming, winter's coming. Like I right. was terrified of, you know, the Chicago winter because, you know, we went pretty much full lockdown here in Chicago last year. And a lot of places are concerned Like that's the direction where we're heading. And, you know, we, we just, uh, our mayor in Chicago just, you know, forced another mass mandate. So it seems like things are definitely trending in the wrong direction, unfortunately. So it's just really, yeah, like you said, it's, it's very unpredictable. And it's like, how do you plan a business around that? I'm curious on what your guys' sure. thoughts are with Delta variant and you know, you see some states really responding to it and others not so much, even cities uh, within these states. What do you think is going to be next on the horizon for the industry as a whole? Yeah, I think uh, from the from the industry perspective, you're totally right. Uh, it varies by state. It varies by vaccination level. It varies by weather, I think, is the uh, winter season approaches and we hit colder temperatures. I think we're going to see a little bit of a repeat of what we had, you know, last winter, obviously the Delta variants way more, uh, contagious than what we had previous summer. We also have a lot more precautions in, in play with the, you know, the development of the vaccine. And so I think we're probably going to see stricter rules around who gets to come into what facilities we're going to see ownership of, uh, companies taking a more proactive approach to how are we protecting our current customers and how are we protecting the employees that we're bringing into work? Would we have those precautions in play? I don't know, about Owen, you might have a different idea. No, yeah, I absolutely. I, I completely agree. And I, I think, you know, another factor is, you know, a lot about this whole labor shortage is always, you know, focus on wages, but, you know, a lot of people forget, a lot of people don't want to work during a pandemic and then, you know, there, there's a lot of health consequences, you know, there's a good a majority of hospitality workers, you know, still uh, choose not to get the vaccine vaccine. And, you know, they're still exposed to these viruses and that's just, an, uh, you know, another harsh reality. So, you know, trying, you know, if COVID does come back, we're, we're still like, even if it's not, if even if vaccinations are great, like we're, we're still, you know, you have one outbreak in your restaurant or your hotel, like that could affect your entire business like that. And there's just like, if everything's going smoothly, you can still have these crazy little variables that just, you know, set everything off. So you really need to hammer home, you know, like COVID restrictions and these things all add to your operating, you know, costs and, you know, customers are always reluctant when you do those things, but that's just kind of what has to be done, I think. Definitely. Yeah. And then, so I guess I'm, we, we keep talking about, you know, all the downsides, but I think, you know, I, I don't like to present a problem without a solution. So I think there's definitely solutions at play here. Um, and, and there's, you know, the, like I said earlier, there, there's really 
two key components to solving, you know, the staffing shortage. And that's like, how fast can you bring in, you know, new staff and how can you prevent staff from leaving? Um, so that's essentially what needs to be done. It's just basically these need to work in tandem because they're not mutually exclusive. So I think it's very important that you, you know, you got to maintain the employees that you, you have, but you also have to, you know, this is a two, totally new marketing game for trying to bring in new employees. So then here are, here are some tips, you know, that I found that I think, you know, in this new game of ours uh, that, you know, that, that will help bring in employees. So that, that's to build a strong brand, brand. That's first of all. So now, like, you know, pre-COVID marketing techniques, trying to bring in employees won't work anymore. Uh, there's just too, mu too much competition in the, you know, in the market, the market's too saturated. Uh, you know, you got like, you have to compete now with, you know, like I said earlier, Amazon and, you know, $15 minimum wages in different counties. So, uh, you need, you know, you need to get on the zip recruiters you need to get on the glass doors and these, you need to be digital. Um, I found even some of the, like the not so tech savvy, uh, people trying to find it hospitality jobs all go on the websites because, you know, they can just plug in all their information and then they get a list of, you know, all the jobs in the area. So I know a lot of people have been utilizing those from a, you know, labor standpoint. And, you know, yeah, uh, I think we basically, you basically have to publicize a better job description as well. You, uh, there's, there's so much, you know, you can't just say, Hey, we're offering, you know, good hours and, you know, a livable, you know, minimum wage anymore, you know, like, or like, you know, we, we, we pay this hour right. plus tips. It's gotta be better than that. You gotta have more incentives. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that's not going to cut it in this, you know, post or, you know, this post uh, COVID kind of market thing. If yeah. Just on it. And I, and I think the a uniting factor of all of these points that you're bringing up is, mm -hmm. You know, there there is people that we can hire, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to rethink how we're doing that hiring process, and the best way that we can do that is we just need more time, right? Yeah. A lot of these, uh, you know, companies that I work with, the individuals who are responsible for recruiting and hiring are the same individuals who are responsible for scheduling, responsible for current employees, uh, all the different, you know, HR generalist functions. Um, so I think, you know, there are plans of action we can take, but a lot of what we need to do too is free up time. I don't mm -hmm. know if you'd agree with that or not. No, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I think I, one of my buddies, he recently just did a kind of like a walk-in interview process at his restaurant, um, you know, just really opening up his door, making it as easy as possible for, you know, employees to come find him because he just opened up this new breakfast place downtown Chicago and, you know, right. he tried doing all these online options and then like, you know, he got, he had some success with them, but I think, you know, you need to, you, you can't just do one thing. You have to be in, you know, multiple pockets doing, mm -hmm. you know, focusing your attention across the board. So, you know, he's running his online campaign then these guys in person, open door, walk in policy, you know, or we'll walk in interview policy that he does, you know, once a week, just trying to, you know, make his, make himself and his brand as accessible to the labor market. Sure. And I mean, you're yeah. talking about 15 to 20% of his week then is spent on mm -hmm. you know, these recruiting efforts. So it's obviously oh, a very yeah. important thing for him. Yeah. He's, he's like, yeah, I do less, you know, less <laughs> you know, inventory than, you know, now he's a full-time marketer essentially. And I was like, yeah, um, <laughs> it's pretty much your job now, but uh, that's just unfortunately how things are going these days. And uh, you know, I think it'll definitely slow down at some point. Uh, but for the time being, uh, th there's just, there's too much market saturation and you're going to need to up your incentives. You you're going to need to, uh, you know, really write those descriptive, you know, employer resumes, essentially, you know, say, you know, we, we offer a payable wage, you know, or, you know, you can get, you, we, we pay over time, uh, you, you'll, you'll have to, you know, offer these incentives that, you might not have previously done and you know i it's a lot easier said than done i understand that and i think what 
needs to be done to get to that point is like you have to be even more tight on your overhead costs, you know, your, your all any type of, you know, overhead, any type of the supplier market contracts, you need to focus up, you know, those operating costs. Sure. And then, and then, you know, take whatever leftover you have from, you know, tightening up those a little bit and then spending it on, you know, being, employer employee competitive or yeah employer competitive and those aren't really like you know decisions we necessarily want to make but it's you know inaction is the worst action we could take and Mm. so it's you know we're all facing this difficulty together and so the quicker that we can reach a point of action i think the better we are at addressing or at least understanding how we can address this problem Mm -hmm. so no, yeah. And, you know, if you're doing all these things already, I, I think the best way to, you know, avoid employee turn, turnover is just keeping your employees. And, you know, there's a lot of good ways you can do to essentially do that. You can, you know, you can offer these better incentives. Uh, you can, you know, just you really just sit down with your employees and figure out what they want. I know uh, this other uh, this, this chef at this restaurant in Chicago, he's just been, you know, he's been doing weekly check-ins with his employees, just making sure they're happy, you know, making sure everything's going well at home. Like these are still tough times. And, you know, he's just sitting down, uh, like he loves his employees. Some of them have been as restaurant for, you know, 10 plus years, he knows them, you know, he knows their entire family. So it's like, uh, I think a restaurant is very, or a hot, even a hotel is very much essentially just, you know, it's a family. So like, it's very important to have these dialogues and these conversations with your employees, making sure they're happy, make, making sure they're, you know, being taken care of. If they're not, uh, you know, figure out ways to, you know, address that gap and, you know, meet in the middle and you can discuss, you know, like career growth, just give them incentives, you know, to keep them, uh, you know, happy. I and mean, like it's people who are just, you know, stagnant, not really moving up or down, and, you know, not really feeling like they're making an impact on their business or not having dialogues, those are unhappy employees and they're likely to leave. They're likely to find something more stable. Um, but, it, you know, if they have an emotional connection or if they, you know, feel like they're a part of your family, like they're going to stay. They're going to, you know, they'll be with you through the thick and thin. And, you know, a lot of a lot of those people that, you know, didn't quit their jobs during these, you know, restaurants were like the happy ones. I don't think... I think if you were unhappy, you probably, you know, left during COVID and, uh, you know, a lot sure. of them just took unemployment, benefits, but a lot of them turned them down because they're like, yeah, this is my, uh, you know, I've been working at this restaurant for 10 years. Uh, Rewarding like, royalty. I love it. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think there's definitely uh, a way to, you know, maintain that rapport. Never with, with employees. Um, COVID as a whole, you know, we see this huge, huge push for, work-life balance principles and, you know, mental health. Um, and people are, you know, vouching for that more. They're looking for ways to work that more into their work life. Um, so having that idea of, you know, pushing the incentives so they are incentivized more to stick with, um, you know, their current employee situation, is it's crucial. It really is. Yeah. And part of that battle, too, is when things aren't going right. Uh, You know, I think we've all had situations in our past where we've kind of we've known that someone probably had the foot out the door and whatever workplace, what you know, that we find ourselves in. Uh, Examples of that are when people come in with less enthusiasm, if they're coming in late or leaving early or taking long lunches they're speaking up less, they're taking more days off. There's kind of all those different small indicators where you you see them in, uh, in the back, you just kind of know that they're probably not going to stay around too much longer. Uh, but the biggest problem with that is you're kind of guessing, right? We're, we're making guesses, we're making assumptions. We don't necessarily know that people are, you know, fed up or aggravated with their working situation. But what we do know is something's different than the rest. We just haven't been able to hone in on what is different and how we can address that. Because the ultimate goal is to retain these people. We hired them for a reason. We saw something special or something that uh, you know provided value to our company. We're not at that stage anymore. 
best way that we can identify that is uh, hitting some qualitative and quantitative approaches for how we're managing our, our labor and our, mm -hmm. our workforce, right? So from a quantitative perspective, we know when people are coming in late or leaving early, uh, but in order for us to grab that kind of data information, it takes a lot of time out of our days. Like Owen was talking about with his friend in Chicago who's spending 15 to 20% of his week just recruiting people. I can't even imagine how many hours he's working if he's maintaining, you know, his operational needs, he's maintaining his, yeah, yeah. Uh, the same guy who's interviewing and, and talking with his, his employees every single week. Like that is a lot of time that people are taking. How are we going to yeah. collect that data so that we know how we're doing? You know, we're almost like hitting the gas, going, going, going. We're not necessarily looking at the path that we've taken so far and, and seeing what's, you know, dropped off along the way. Um, attendance reporting then is a really good example of how we can quantify those different um, signs that something's going wrong. Uh, attendance reports will give you, you know, in the little picture right here, we can see someone on July 15th took an unpaid leave, uh, but we're seeing the rest of the timeframes, you know, they're starting their actual time periods within five minutes or so of uh, when they were scheduled. And so to me, if I'm looking at this and thinking this person on July 15th was scheduled to work, they took an unpaid leave, but the rest of the week, they were totally great when it comes to attendance. I'm not worried about that because things do come up as employees. You know, there's not necessarily anything that's showing me that this wasn't, uh, you know, an experience that was out of the ordinary. Uh, I think other aspects that we can try and quantify are tracking trends with the use of PTO uh, or sick leave or anything like that. When people are requesting that time, if it's something within a day or it's the day of and they're asking, oh, I'm actually going on vacation or something. Those are probably signs that, you know, something's different and someone's not planning well enough because things are arising. Maybe they're interviewing for different jobs or they're just fed up with their work kind of thing. Uh, we actually have an example right here of two different individuals uh, who uh, over the course of, I think this is seven days, the guy at the top was punctual six days. And I think that was actually the previous picture, uh, punctual six days, left early once. Uh, so 85% of the time they're showing up. I think that that is a pretty good example of someone who is punctual and someone who, you know, we want to invest more time with our you know, our workforce and, and provide, uh, you know, maybe career growth, as Owen was talking about earlier, things like that. At the bottom, we have an individual who arrived late six days out of seven. They left early, two of them. They were punctual 0% of the time, but they still showed up every single day. And so as a manager, uh, as I'm trying to go through the interview process is what I, Owen was talking about earlier of engaging my workforce. I think that I can save a lot of time by taking this data and understanding who do I actually need to talk to more than others? Uh, because it seems like the individual in the second picture is, uh, you know, not living up to the expectations and we need to probably invest more time and understand what that is. And if we have the opportunity to, you know, make them, uh, you know, enjoy and work in a better way. Uh, we have a poll going up right now too, which is, do you currently, uh, use reporting features in your management technology. And it looks like a lot of the crowd right now is is utilizing that. And so it kind of shows the fact that like, this is good value. This is something that people enjoy. Um, I don't know, Owen, from your previous experiences at your restaurants, did you utilize or did you know of any attendance reporting that um, management was was capitalizing on? Not really. I mean, we had the, you know, the, the micros outputs essentially. And, you know, I had my Excel sheets. I kind of like to do everything um, to, you know, th this was, you know, a few years ago. So the, 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 the technology has gotten way better um, than, than then. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, these are the type of things that, you know, when you're working so many extra hours, you need to, you know, be very, cognizant of, you know, your, your time allocation and, you know, there's no yeah. better way to doing it than, you know, a good management technology. Definitely. Uh, and so back to what I was talking about with the quantitative and qualitative approaches to understanding our workforces, 
uh, you know, we've touched on that quantitative, but the other aspect is that that qualitative. Uh, we're not going to understand what's going wrong with that data. Uh, like we know things are going wrong, but we don't necessarily understand what that is. And if we're not taking the time to get that feedback, then, you know, the data is not necessarily useful. You know, the data needs to tell a story. The best way that we can tell that story is by getting feedback. I think uh, more than anything, employees value being heard. Um, so when it comes to getting feedback, you may not always have a solution to that, but at bare minimum, if people are filling out surveys and you know trying to provide input, I think you reward that because when you fill out a survey, it may not you know go anywhere. You feel like you're not being heard when a manager reaches out and says, hey, thanks for the, the good feedback. Thanks for the bad feedback. I think people are more inclined to give uh, information. And I think automating as much of that feedback process as possible is another way to save time focusing on uh, your recruiting efforts and your attention efforts. When we know based off the feedback that we're getting, who's unhappy and who is happy, we can address those populations in two much different ways. Uh, so always reinforcing that open channel of communication between the employees and the HR man, uh, management and getting feedback almost every shift, maybe weekly, semi-annually, you know, whatever time frame works best for you. We just need to make sure that employees don't feel like a, a cog in the system. They feel like a part of the yeah, team. And having that feedback right? loop just saves you so much time in the long run, um, you know, determining, you know, any, you know, unhappiness gaps. So it's, it's, this is a very important step. Because, you know, it's data Definitely. that you can even refer to years from now and you can compare and contrast numbers from, you know, being, having a, a data from the time in a pandemic and five years from now, we're, and hopefully, you know, hopefully we're out of the woodworks. Um, but what I love about this slide is it looks like you can, do this from your phone. Is that right, Bo? Correct. Yeah, this would be, you know, at the clock out time period. Uh, this is actually a screenshot from our own software. Uh, just getting the opportunity. How did the shift go? Right when you're, you know, it's fresh in your mind and you know what went well, you can differentiate it from the rest of the shifts. I think this is one of the best times to, to do that. And then we get that information. We don't have to worry about reaching out or worrying, you know, who worked what shifts, managing the schedule in that way. We just get That's that great. data right on the That's spot. That's awesome. So, well, very insightful, guys. Thank you so much for you know coming on and joining me. Um, before everybody leaves, uh, again, we have a little survey that's going to pop up right on the bottom left of your screen there. Um, it'll just take a minute, a couple questions. And again, as a little extra incentive, we do have that $100 Amazon gift card that we will be giving out. So again, keep an eye on those inboxes. We'll get back to you, uh, whether you're the winner. Um, if not, we'll get back to you with the results so you guys can analyze, um, you know, just to see how prepared your organization is for staffing shortages and kind of get a gauge on the hospitality industry as a whole. Um, without further ado, we'll see you guys at the next webinar.